Okay, uh, so uh, good evening uh, to everybody. I mean, that's to people in Hawaii, actually. And uh, good morning to people in the Philippines. Um, I hope all of you are doing well as we um, look forward to celebrating the holidays. Uh, my name is June Colmenares, commander of the Knights of Rizal Aloha chapter, and I will be your MC for today's uh, event. As chapter commander, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to our 12th and final lecture, uh, part one of our Rizalian lecture series. Um, a major goal of the Knights of Rizal is to educate people on the life, works, and ideas of our national hero, Dr. Jose Rizal. And this lecture series is uh, one way by which uh, our chapter endeavors to help achieve this objective. Uh, I would like to remind our participants that the lecture will be for about you know, an hour, yeah. followed by a <clears throat> reaction, and then there will be a Q&A session after that. Um, I would like to remind everybody to mute your microphones when you are not speaking. I now call on Sir Dr. Raymond Leongson, KGCR, to introduce our guest speaker. Hi, uh, aloha and uh, mabuhay. Uh, good evening, Hawaii and America. Good morning, Philippines. Uh, the you. 12th and final lecture in the first virtual Rizalian lecture series organized by the Knights of Rizal Aloha chapter features a widely known Rizalian enthusiast and scholar. Uh, I first came across him when I uh, I mean, I heard about him and first started uh, coming across his works when I came across uh, one article he wrote, Rizal, the first emo. And I wondered what the word emo was. And I found out it referred to uh, a person who is emotional or may pagkasenti, as they say, sentimental in many ways and loves to wear black. Yeah. Anyway, turned out the author was Michael Charles, Charleston Shaw Chua, and he simply grabbed my attention. Uh, Sir Michael Charleston Shaw Chua, KGOR, is the most active public historian on Philippine tele television and one of the most visible history speakers in social media and cyberspace in, in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. He teaches at the De La Salle uh, University of Manila, uh, Department of History, and at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Department of Broadcast Communication. A former deputy chapter commander of the successors chapter of the Knights of Rizal. He also was a spokesperson for the Knights of Rizal on the issue of, remember that, Torre de Manila, and which we uh, referred to here in Hawaii as well as La Torpe de Manila. Um, with a BA and MA uh, in history, he graduated, I mean, uh, with a BA and MA in history, he is a PhD anthropology student at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. He is author of the book, Bonifacio Ang Unang Pangulo, or Bonifacio, the first president. And he is also known and a known teacher and speaker on the life, works, and writings of Jose Rizal. Um, he was an uh, original bottom liner in the bottom line with Boy Abunda. Historical consultant of history with Lord uh, Teleserias Ilustrado and Katipunan. Uh, the, he also is, uh, is one of the creators of the show. He is the creator of the show television, uh, show time television segment watched by students and teachers all over the country in their online classes. Many of these segments are actually available online. You can check them out on YouTube. Uh, he also writes a Saturday column for the Manila Times. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you, uh, sir, soon to be a doctor too, hopefully uh, sooner, very soon, Michael Charleston Xiao Chua, KGOR. Xiao yeah, Xiao Chua, uh, KGOR of the successors uh, chapter um, of the Knights of Rizal in Manila. 
Baka sayang umaga. Good morning, everyone from Manila. It's a, it's very, it's a rainy day actually in Manila, but I think there uh, a lot of people are affected by the Odette storm that just passed uh, in uh, the Visayas in Mindanao area. Mm-hmm. So we, of course, we we offer our prayers and uh, hopefully we can also help them through our donations. Uh, also, I would like to first thank Sir. Uh, Sir Raymond, thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank the one who invited me here, uh, Sir Serafin Colmenares Jr., PhD, MPH, the Administration of the State Health Planning and Development Agency of the Department of Health of the State of Hawaii. Uh, and all of you here in the uh, Aloha uh, chapter, Center for Visalian uh, studies. Uh, you have Sir Clement Bautista here. Thank you so much. Sir Stanley, Sir Federico Magdalena, whom I met in the UGAT conference before. Uh, hello, uh, Michelle. Thank you for coming as well. And I would like to also acknowledge a very important uh, uh, participant here. I did not expect that he will come. He is uh, uh, my colleague in the history department of the De La Salle University, Manila, who is also an author of two new Rizal books, mm. uh, Karugtong, which is uh, a ilang paglalaro sa katang isip ni Jose Rizal. These are, about, these are uh, plays that explores the fiction that Jose Rizal made. Okay. Uh, eh, I think it's avail- available in Shopee or Lazada. I don't know if you have that in Hawaii. And also, you have here essays on Rizal's world and works, what Capitan Tiago served, and Padre Damaso ate. So, Dr. Victores uh, is here with us today. And that's why, in a way, I'm quite nervous because he's, he's uh, more knowledgeable. Uh, but uh, uh, he's a very good friend of mine. And uh, I really like to get this uh, uh, feedback. Okay, so um, I would like to present now my uh, uh, slides. The last days of Jose Rizal, clarif- clarifying the clouds in the life of the national hero. Uh, again, thank you to uh, the Knights of Rizal, Aloha Chapter, non omnis moria, hindi lahat sa akin ay papanaw. Maraming salamat po. We're still in the final leg of the 160th uh, birth year of Jose Rizal, a very important uh, milestone that apparently we were not able to uh, celebrate much because I think it was overshadowed by the quincentennial commemorations in the Philippines, uh, the you know the circumnavigation of the world and the victory at Mactan 500 years ago. Um, again, when you when you have time, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow my social media accounts, and please uh, visit my website shoutshow.net and bangkanishow.wordpress.com. Uh, I already delivered this lecture for the Knights of Rizal uh, last year for the first time, but I delivered it in Filipino. So this is the first time that I'm going to deliver it in English for our, uh, uh, for our international audience. Okay, so this is uh, Dr. Jose Rizal, our national hero in the Philippines. Uh, you already know a lot about his life, so I'll, I'll go straight to the point about what happened to him when the Philippine Revolution started. Uh, there is a misconception, of course, that uh, Jose Rizal's life sparked the Philippine Revolution. Uh, Jose Rizal's death sparked the Philippine Revolution. You know, those who are not so familiar with history, they always say that. They always liken it to Ninoy Aquino, uh, dying and of course after two years that uh, snowballed to what uh, the ends of the, what what the people power revolution uh, uh, the events of the people power revolution yet in results uh, if if you're going to look at results history the revolution happened first uh, of course there are uh, there are uh, points of view that he inspired it with his writings which is also correct. Okay, but uh, his death was not the one that inspired the revolution. Yeah? 
In fact, his death was the result of the Philippine Revolution. Uh, that, yeah, we should clarify that. Okay, so Rizal's heroism, this is the abstract, Rizal's heroism is only highlighted by his death, you know, but was surely defined by his life given in the service of his people's rights and liberties. This is a clarification that Rizal was not a hero because he was killed in Bagumbaya. <laughs> so it, it, it just made him, uh, his, uh, shall we say, his legend, Kumbaga, cemented, that cemented this uh, heroism. But uh, his whole life is, was dedicated to service. We, are all, we always have this propensity to focus on the death of a hero, uh, to define his heroism. But of course, it's important. I'm not saying it is not. He died the martyr, and that's, that, that cemented his legacy. Yet his last days, filled with both humanly ambivalence and heroic resolve, clarifies many of the misconceptions about his stand on certain issues that plague us for many years. The scholarship of the past 20, 30 years uh, clarifies many of these things as reflected in his last days. So apparently, a lot of people would like to have a clean, shaved narrative of Jose Rizal's life and death, which is not the case. There are so many things to resolve, so many gray areas, and in many ways, the last days clarified uh, many of these gray areas. Um, and I would like to also point out that Jose Rizal, as a human being, um, not just the trivialities about his life, but also in terms of emotion. Uh, Sir Raymond uh, said here that he read my essay of Jose Rizal, the first emo, because I felt that Jose Rizal was emotional like an emo and he's like, you know, sometimes always in a dark mood. And that actually is real if you're going to look at his life in the Pitan. There's a book, I'll show you. There's a book here a new one by Noel Villaroman. Uh, it's called The Pitanon. This is the very first work about Rizal in the Pitan that um, makes it, shall we say, um, a day-by-day -day account of his life. And when you put it a day-by-day -day account of his life in the Pitan, you will see that he had many episodes of darkness. He was depressed a lot. Uh, because of what happened to him. So yes, he was productive, but he was depressed a lot. So I, I always say that he, in many ways, he's very much like us. We, Despite the many, many hardships of life, despite the many, many insecurities, we always try to do something. And I believe that as Knights of Rizal, we have to be, we have to have that kind of resolve. Despite all the odds, we're going to give something for our people. Thank you so much. So, um, so there you go. So we'll clarify some of his gray areas in this uh, lecture. So the Philippine Revolution happened August of 1896. He was actually uh, in Manila still, was in Manila still at that time, aboard the ship. Emilio Asinto, disguised, and went aboard the ship. Emilio Asinto, the brains of the Katipunan, the brains of the revolution, and a young, a young guy, he climbed the ship and told Rizal, you know, before something happens to you, let us, let us, you know, let us go. We will we'll escape you and, and uh, you will be out of danger. And Rizal really said, no, we will, I, will, I, I want to give my word of honor. And uh, that was that. And so on the way, to Cuba because he offered his services to the Spanish army. And a lot of people are saying that Rizal should be branded actually as a traitor because he wanted to, he, he was betraying the Cuban revolutionaries who have the same plight with Filipino revolutionaries by serving as a doctor in Cuba. Of course, if I'm not mistaken, it was Blumentritt who actually said that uh, Rizal went to uh, Cuba to uh, study revolution to study revolution, and so maybe he can help in the revolution. But whatever it was, a lot of people question that, but whatever it was, uh, he was held 
in his cabin at, at the MB Isla de Panaydac at Barcelona on October 6, 1896. This is... Uh, more than a month after the Philippine Revolution exploded on the 24th of August, 1896. At 3 a.m., October 6, 1896, um, Rizal was awakened to be brought to Montjuich Prison in Barcelona, Spain. Of course, the Montjuich was a, a notorious prison. It was like in Tramuros, <laughs> world uh, prison in, uh, in Barcelona, Spain. And October 6, at 2 p.m., he was interviewed, and it was like deja vu, because when he was interviewed by General Eulogio Despujol, he was, at first, he was the Governor General of the Philippines in 1892. And uh, when he was interviewed by General Eulogio Despujol, he was arrested after. <laughs> and because he, they found leaflets in his sister's, uh, in, in, they found leaflets in Rizal's sister's uh, things. And of course, because of the La Liga Filipina, they arrested him and brought him to the Pita. I, did, I mean, just imagine how Rizal would have felt that when he faced this Paul again, he was under arrest. Uh, and of course, he would be brought back to the Philippines the same day, 8 p.m. Uh, he left Barcelona for Manila. Ah, there is a very interesting note here. Um, someone and I did not include it here, someone actually wanted to save Jose Rizal by invoking uh, Rito Pabias Corpus uh, in uh, Singapore. Oh, Jose Maria Basa. Oh, Jose Maria Basa, uh, when they heard that Rizal was arrested, acted very swiftly oh, and uh, asked the court of Singapore oh, uh, to remove Rizal from the steamer, the crux of Mr. Ford's legal contention, they, they, they called the lo local lawyer, he was carrying, uh, uh, they said that um, the crux of Mr. Ford's legal contention was that Rizal was illegally detained on the Spanish steamer. So they, if that was successful, that would have you know, saved Jose Rizal. But the problem was, of course, uh, the Chief Justice, Lionel Cox, denied the writ on the ground that the Colon, the ship, was carrying Spanish troops to the Philippines, hence it was a warship of a foreign power, which under international law was beyond the jurisdiction of the Singapore authorities. And that was sad. Uh, that could have saved Jose Rizal's life. On November 3, Rizal was brought to Fort Santiago where other patriots, including his brother Pasiano, were being tortured to implicate him. Uh, Pasiano refused to sign anything despite being his body broken and his left hand crushed. So, of course, we all know how big the influence of uh, Kuya Pasiano is to Jose Rizal. There is no Jose Rizal national hero without his brother Pasiano. Uh, and we believe... That while Jose Rizal was uh, in prison, he, he, this, is, this was Fort Santiago before, and I, I hope you visited this when you were in the Philippines. This was the original, or I think this was the uh, original barracks uh, when it, uh, as it appeared before, the cell of Dr. Jose Rizal, uh, which was destroyed during World War II, but they were able to re- uh, shall we say, re, re, rebuild it. And then thank you, Sir Vic, for some of the photographs here. Ah, uh, yeah. So this is the present site of the, the cell of Jose Rizal, uh, where he was brought from November 3 to December 29. So this is the cell as it appeared for many years yeah. with a sculpture that was supposedly done by Guillermo Tolentino, national artist. Uh, Rizal was a VIP prisoner. He was brought in a room, uh, so to speak. He, it in a room, okay? But uh, uh, Pasiano was brought supposedly with other people in the dungeon. Uh, that, that's, the, well, that's, that's the belief of some. He was tortured there uh, with the usual uh, techniques of torture. Uh, they put... Uh, large nails or sticks 
between the fingernails and the skin. Uh, they also, uh, what do you call this? Uh, they beat him. And uh, sometimes they beat them upside down. So, and other things. Now, this is the catch. On 20 November, a few days after his, uh, he was admitted to Fort Santiago, the preliminary investigation began with, the, with Rizal appearing before Judge Advocate Colonel Francisco Olive. The investigation lasted for five days. And in the book, this was, uh, the, the interrogation was detailed in a book that is easy, readily available, easily available, The Trial of Rizal, uh, edited and translated by Horacio de la Costa. On 26 November, the records of the case were handed over to Governor General Ramon Blanco, who then appointed Captain Rafael Dominguez as a special judge advocate. So this is uh, Governor General Ramon Blanco. Supposedly, he was, um, he was more sympathetic to Rizal, supposedly, but he was the one who actually, uh, shall we say, uh, facilitated the beginning of the trial. He was, uh, of course, very busy. Um, dealing with the Philippine Revolution, the battles of the Philippine Revolution that was happening at the time. December 8, 1896. From a list submitted to him by the authorities, he chose the brother of his friend, Lieutenant Luis Tabiel de Andrade, to become his trial lawyer. So the, the, the name Tabiel de Andrade rang a bell. And so they were able to say that, oh, uh, he was able to pick, uh, I want to pick this guy. And apparently he was uh, uh, a brother of his friend. He was only made to choose among army officers and not a civilian lawyer. This was one of the things that makes, they said, Jose Rizal's trial um, in a way murky because he was a civilian. But of course you have to understand that his, um, like Ninoy Aquino, their cases were subversion. Uh, so they were instigating a revolution. So that's why both, actually, both Rizal and Ninoy were tried in a military court. And of course, Ninoy went to the Supreme Court saying, this is a mockery of justice. Uh, I am a civilian. Why are you trying me in a, in, in, in a, in a, in a military court? And of course, the, the answer to that is that because the case is actually rebellion. A rebellion. Um, 11 December, in his prison cell, Rizal was read the charges against him based on the uh, initial investigation. Principal organizer and the living soul of the Filipino insurrection. The founder of societies, periodicals and books dedicated to fomenting and propagating the ideas of rebellion. If you're going to look at the way the um, the charges were led or were, 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 you know, formulated, the wordings of the formulation of the charges, medyo uh, malawa. It's kind of sweeping. But if you're going to look at it, you all know that he did not found the Katipunan. Definitely. The one who instigated the revolution. You can say that Noli Metanjo and El Filibusterismo maybe tried to foment and propagate ideas of rebellion. And in many ways, he, he was guilty because of that. So it, it's kind of why then, you know, they really wanted to implicate him. Huh? He was the living soul of the Filipino insurrection. Alma de la rebellion. Alma de la rebellion. And uh, Professor Bani Biernas told me, uh, he, he, he said this, it's quite easy to actually connect the Katipunan from, from the La Liga Filipina. Uh, why? Because if you're going to look at it, many of the members of the Katipunan were former members of the Liga. Right? And the problem also was that the Liga Filipina, without results knowledge, or he was, he, well, was uh, resurrected through the Cuerpo de Compromisarios. Because we all know that the La Liga Filipino was uh, founded on July 3, 1892, but he was arrested after three days. But after some months, they were able to regroup again, and they actually facilitated donations 
the collecting of donations for La Solidaridad. Uh, including Apolinario Mabini. So, Apolinario Mabini was the one collecting money to send to Marcelo Del Pilar. So that was the continuation of the La Liga Filipina of Rizal. But of course, Rizal did, they, he said, Rizal said he did not know that. Huh? And also, the name of the Katipunan is in many ways similar to La Liga Filipina. You know, I found the document Oh, later we will, we will look at that. I, I found the we found the document that is a Tagalog translation of the La Liga Filipina Constitution that actually says or equates Katipunan, uh, our Liga, Liga, I mean Liga with Katipunan, because actually Katipunan just means an association. It's it's it's, it's a it's a Tagalog word for association. So. In, in, the, in the Tagalog translation of the Liga Constitution, an old one that was found, they call the Liga Katipunan. Uh, which is funny. Also, uh, also, you have there, wait a minute, wait a minute, there. We also, we also, we also can see the, uh, Spaniards might see the connection because if we're going to look at the name, the nomenclature of the Katipunan, the name of the Katipunan, kataas-taasan, kagalang-galang na Katipunan ng mga anak ng bayan. Katipunan Association, Liga. Liga. Ng mga anak ng bayan. Who are the anak ng bayan? The Filipinos. Katipunan ng mga anak ng bayan, Liga Pilipina. Aside from a lot of the connection, the nomenclature is actually also similar. Huh? So, basically, the charge against Rizal, basically, is that he founded the Katipunan. That's it. Uh, his writings, of course, but principally because he founded the Katipunan. Uh, Pio Valenzuela was part of the witnesses against Rizal. <laughs> Pio Pio, Pio Valenzuela uh, was the Katipunan member who was asked by Andres Bonifacio to proceed to the PITA to talk to Rizal in joining the Philippine Revolution. Uh, uh, and I don't know if uh, in the book of Loro Kibuyan, uh, the A Nation Aborted, he clarifies this because uh, who's this guy? Pio Valenzuela gave so many versions of the story of the meeting. In the court, in the court uh, proceedings where he was supposed to implicate to Serizal, Pio Valenzuela told the judges, uh, we invited him to join the Katipunan and Valenzuela said, no, no, a thousand, uh, and Rizal said, no, no, a thousand times no. No, no, a thousand times no. Okay. So that was the, uh, that was what he said in the court. But after many years, he will retract what he said or he will add a detail. So we offered him the presidency, Pio Valenzuela said. He refused. But he said something. If you want your revolution to successful, you ask the help of the rich people. You get arms and then ask the help of the rich people. Make Antonio Luna your, your uh, general. And you know, Valenzuela asked, what if the rich will not help us? Rizal said, and this is his term, according to Valenzuela, you have to neutralize them because if they will not be for you, they will be against you. So you have two versions. And they, there are totally different implications. Number one, when Rizal said, 
supposedly no, no, a thousand times no, he was against the revolution. And a lot of the Rizal uh, critics are pointing this out that you know Rizal should be cancelled as our national hero because he was totally against the revolution that was instigated by the people. Why is he great to us? Why do we even have a Knights of Rizal? We should destroy this knighthood because Rizal was a traitor to the revolution of the Filipino people. But in Valenzuela's second testimony, he changed when, when after many years, Rizal now although he did not want to be part of the Katipunan, was telling the Katipunan what to do to be successful. These are two different things. Now, who, who's Valenzuela? Are we, who, 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 who's Valenzuela are we going to believe? Valenzuela in one or Valenzuela two? <laughs> See? So, this is it. Now, what was the truth? Why did why did Rizal, or why did Valenzuela said to the court, no, no, a thousand times no, and then, Rizal, and, and then Valenzuela will change his story after that. Now, Plomo Kibuyan has an answer. And what is the answer? According to Plomo Kibuyan, Pio Valenzuela was actually saving Jose Rizal from death. By saying that Rizal refused to help in the revolution, Pio Valenzuela was implying that Jose Rizal was not guilty. Do you get me? Right? That is very important. That is very important to know. Now, what was that true? Was Rizal, did Rizal say something? Uh, did Rizal... Uh, say no, no, a thousand times no? Or did he really said something to the effect that, you know, if you want to be successful, do something? <laughs> you know what happened? I read something in the trial of Rizal that shocked me. Look at what Rizal answered in uh, this uh, question. Uh, aside from bringing a patient to him at the beta, what other object did Pio Valenzuela have in going there? What did they talk about? And what did he tell him? Uh, the answer of Rizal was this. Huh? Wait a minute. He said, Don Pio told the prisoner that there was to be an uprising and that they were worried about what would happen to the prisoner in the pita. The prisoner told him, wait, this was Rizal, but they recorded him in third person because this is a court, a uh, no, formal court proceeding. Basically, Rizal is speaking. The prisoner, I told him that it was hardly the time to embark on such foolhardy ventures. As there was no unity among the various classes of Filipinos, nor did they have arms, nor ships, nor education, nor any of the other requirements for a resistance movement. Let them learn from what was happening in Cuba, where the people, although possessing abundant means and the backing of a great power and being schooled in war, are powerless to achieve their objectives. Moreover, whatever may be the issue of the struggle, it will be to Spain's advantage to grant concessions to the Philippines. For this reason, it is in my opinion that they ought to wait. You know, if you're going to look at it, in many ways, Rizal implicated himself already here and confirmed the second version of Pio Valenzuela's testimony in which Rizal actually said, yes, this, is, this might be foolhardly. Huh? It is not wise to embark on these ventures. Because we do not have the requirements to, to have a revolution. So you have to wait. <laughs> so if you're going to look at it, it's Rizal who implicated himself here. Because he was already telling the Katipunan, this is what I believe. I believe in revolution, but you have to wait. And this is what is clarified by Plomo Kibuyan. Plomo Kibuyan's 
uh, a nation aborted is our answer to the critics of Jose Rizal who want to say that he should be cancelled. Because Rizal was not totally against the revolution. But as a human being and as, a, as, 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 a, as an intellectual, he was ambivalent about the violence of the revolution. He did not want that. But of course, he wanted to, to separate from Spain eventually, but he also wanted to have less violence. It is the last resort. But it, he was not anti-revolution. Now, what was people are saying, like Constantino, that he did not have a concept of the nation. Of course, we respectfully disagree to Renato Constantino by saying that uh, La Liga Filipina was his answer, was, was his uh, way of saying to us that he wanted to separate from Spain and create a new nation. Because in the uh, according to Floro Kibuyan, you will see that in the constitution of the La Liga Filipina, pisanin ng lahat ng archipelago sa isang katipunang malago, masika, pati isang loob to unite the whole archipelago into one compact, vigorous, and homogeneous body. And that body was the nation. And what will they do? Mutual protection in everyone and necessity, damayan sa balang sakuna at kailangan sa buhay, masakitan sa anumang ligalig at kalapastanganan, pasulungin ang pag-aaral, ang pagtatanim at ang komersyo, at pagsasanay at pagkakapit ng mga bagong palakad. Rizal wanted us basically to defend each other against all violence and injustice, encourage instruction, agriculture, and commerce, and apply and study reforms. What does this mean? Basically, Rizal wanted us to become a united people, a vigorous and compact people. He wants us to help each other and love each other and defend each other against all injustices and human rights violations. And we should study, we should make tanim, we should, I mean, we should, you know, engage in agriculture. We should do commerce. We should do business. We should be entrepreneurs. We should develop ourselves as a team. This is the vision of Rizal, of our nation. One like all. One like all means pagkakapantay-pantay. This is Rizal's vision of us. And of course, the question is, are we fulfilling it? Are we fulfilling it? Of course, we all try. Uh, bayan yan, diba? damayan, pagmamahalan, pag-ibig. Diba? Tayong lahat ay magkakapatid. Now, to continue, so this, this clarifies the very murky issue about Rizal's involvement in the revolution. Yes, in a way, he did not agree with it, but he did not agree with it because he thought that he it was still not ready, but he was not totally against the revolution. December 13, 1896, Ramon Blanco was suddenly replaced by Camilo de Polavieja. Because, you know, as I said, Ramon Blanco was more sympathetic to Rizal. So someone, you know, maneuvered to remove him. A more ruthless character, this Camilo de Polavieja guy, as Governor General of the Philippines. Dominguez submitted the papers of the Rizal case to Malacanian Palace. Basically, putting Camilo de Polavieja here uh, cements <laughs> Rizal's execution. Okay? So, I'll just check the time. Okay, I have... Uh, I'll try to end in 15, uh, 20 minutes. December 15, Rizal issued this manifesto to certain Filipinos. Okay. Uh, one person in Facebook is telling people, no, oh, I found something. This December 15 manifesto that Rizal wrote that the historians did not want to talk about because they do not want to cancel Rizal. This makes Jose Rizal uh, a coward. You should not, he should not be national hero. You know, he's speaking in FB. Did he even read? What Plomo Kibuyan wrote in A Nation Aborted? Did he even listen to my talk last year where I talked about the December 15 manifesto? We are not ignoring this. We are putting it into context. Ang dami kasi sa Facebook, akala mo nakakita lang ng history book na hindi naman, akala niya siya lang ang nakapagbasa tapos nung nakita niya, sabi niya, ako lang ang nakakalam nito. Baka buwisit! 
I'm very sorry. I have to calm myself. Whew. Yes, the December 15 manifesto was really confusing. <laughs> That's true. We can talk about it. Ano ba nakalagay doon sa December 15 manifesto? Basically, Rizal said, my fellow countrymen, upon my return from Spain, I learned that my name was being used as a rallying cry by someone taking up arms. Now rumors reach me that the disturbances have not ceased. It may be that persons continue to use my name in good or in bad faith. If so, wishing to put a stop to this abuse and to undeceive the gallipol, I hasten to address these lines to you that truth may be known. From the beginning, when I first received information of what was being planned, I opposed it, I fought against it, and I made clear that it was absolutely impossible. I was convinced that the very idea was wholly absurd, worse than absurd. It was disastrous. For I was convinced of the evils which that rebellion would bring in its train. And so, I considered it a privilege if, at whatever sacrifice, I could ward off so much useless suffering. Fellow countrymen, I have given many proofs that I desire as much as the next man liberties for our country. I continued to desire them. But I laid uh, down as a prerequisite the education of the people in order that by means of such instruction and by hard work, they may acquire a personality of their own and so become worthy of such liberties. In my writings, I have recommended study and the civic virtues without which no redemption is possible. Though thoroughly imbued with these ideas, I cannot do less than condemn, as I do condemn, this ridiculous and barbarous uprising flattened behind my back, which both dishonors us Filipinos and discredits those who might have taken our part. I abominate the crimes for which it is responsible and I will have no part in it. With all my heart, I am sorry for those who have rashly allowed themselves to be deceived. Let them then return to their homes and may God pardon those who have acted in bad way. This was quite disappointing if you're going to look at it. But let us give context to this document. Number one, Rizal was being implicated because they thought that he was the founder of the Katipunan. Of course he was pissed. <laughs> of course he will be pissed. If I was the one, if I was Rizal, I will also be pissed. See? And also, because Rizal is still human, he may have told Valenzuela, that I agree with your revolution as long as it is ready. But he still wanted to save his life. Of course, that's very human. And so he wrote this manifesto. You know what? The Spaniards, they were so stupid. I should say. They did not publish this. <laughs> Just look at the effect. If, Jose Rizal pub, if, if they publish this Rizal letter during that time, just imagine the effect. But this was not published. This was, this, this, was, this was thrown in the archives. And so, for many people, Rizal's name was not tarnished because the Spaniards thought, if we're going to bring this out, then he is not guilty. So we will not bring this out. <laughs> Imagine Rizal calling the revolution deception, abusive, uh, impossible, absurd, worse than absurd, disastrous, useless. It, it's condemnable, ridiculous, barbarous. It is criminal and it is deceptive. Muy na kayo. And this is the revolution of the Filipino people under Anders Munipasio. Just imagine. But I, told, I tell you, Rizal is human. He wanted to still save himself. And you have to look at Rizal in his totality. Not with one document. You have to look at all his actions, the things that he gave already to the country. And you also have to look at his last poem. His last poem. So let me 
um, bring you them later. Because the last poem is important. Basically, the last poem cancels this manifesto to the Filipino people of December 15th. But there's one important thing that he said. And what is this? And we should focus on this. He said, I have given many proofs that I deserve as much as the next man liberties for our country, and I continue to deserve them, but I laid down as a prerequisite the education of the people in order by which means of such instruction and by hard work, they may acquire a personality of their own and so become worthy of such liberties. In many ways, although I will not agree with the result that man should be worthy of his freedom because man is free because he is a human. Huh? I mean, he doesn't have to be worthy of it. You should give it to him regardless because he is a human being. That's why we have human rights. But in many ways, it is not bad to also say that we should be worthy of our freedoms. You are free because you are a man, but you can make yourself worthy of that freedom. Yes, that's true. I hope you are not convinced with that. I so, still hope I'm still making sense. Because education is important. Education is important because if people do not have the spirit, their own personality, they will just be like the conquerors. That's a very, very basic. So, so that we would not abuse each other, there should be education. Now, what happened to us? It is as if the, the leaders, some corrupt leaders of the land today have actually learned from the colonizers and they still continue to abuse the Filipino people. If they, they, you know, even if they have degrees, the education that probably they got did not have the personality and the culture of the Filipinos because it was a colonial education that they got. Huh? It is a colonial education that still permeates even if people try to you know, un undo it for many, many years. Huh? So this is still one thing that we Knights of Pesal should work, look forward and work, uh, work to achieve is a more Filipino perspective in education. Huh? And morality, of course. Morality is important. Now, the, also the problem is, one of the people that you have to say, you know, return to their homes was his own family. <laughs> because this document actually says that uh, the Katipunan are collecting donations for his whole family. Para sa pamilya, this is in Katipunan Cypher, in the Archivo General Militar de Madrid, confiscated document that tells us that the Katipunan was soliciting uh, uh, was inviting people for a dinner to solicit money for the family of our president, Dr. Rizal. <laughs> so if you're going to look at it, the Katipunan was actually using the Rizal name to strengthen their uh, activities to recruit. But also because they have Katipunan in the family. Uh, so we all know that Pasiano Rizal was part of it, Jose Parizal was part of it, and Training Rizal was also part of it. So uh, in many ways, whether Rizal knew it or not, I do not know. Kasi I speculate, he probably knew because he was with Pasiano. Pasiano would probably have told him about the Katipunan. Uh, they were living in the same area, Binondo, you know, because they left Calamba already after the the Hacienda question in 1892, 1891. And again, as I said, Rizal was being used by the Katipunan because Emilio Asinto, they got that speech of Asinto in the trial, which actually tells people, long live uh, the Katipunan, long live Jose Rizal. And they pick, put his picture in the meeting places of the Katipunan. So he was such a powerful symbol and that's why, of course, the Spaniards will, it was so easy for the Spaniards to implicate it. December 25, of course, was Rizal's saddest Christmas. He was away from uh, family and friends. And in fact, that morning he wrote Tabiel de Andrade, I'm sorry you cannot come. <laughs> what, what did he write here? I want to read that. It, 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 this is very sad. Uh, he said, uh, there. Uh, to my 
my very distinguished defender, Paul Santiago, December 25, 1896. Uh, the investigating judge has informed me that tomorrow my case will be heard before the court. I was waiting for you this morning to tell you of an important matter, but you undoubtedly, but undoubtedly the pressure of your work did not permit you to come as expected by the investigating judge. So Vizal was waiting for him. He did not come. If you have time, I should like to speak to you before I appear before the court. So I don't know if he, he came after or he came the next morning. Uh, he definitely came the next morning to, to, uh, to fetch him. Uh, I shall be grateful if you come this afternoon, this evening, or tomorrow. Wishing you Merry Christmas, I reiterate. Always your attentive and affectionate servant and client, Jose Um, uh, He was probably remembering the many Christmases with his family when he was young. He was probably remembering the many Christmases with friends abroad. He was probably remembering the Christmas cards that he sent or the Christmas drawings that he sent to his um, nephews and nieces. Uh, like this one. These are actual drawings of Jose Rizal of pine trees, of Christmas trees. The next day, December 26, 8 a.m., was his trial. The trial of Rizal began at Cuartel de España. On the same day, the court martial secretly and unanimously voted for a guilty verdict with the penalty of death before a five inch one. So we will not uh, detail the trial because, you know, in a way I touched on them already, but uh, basically you can read it in the trial of Rizal, uh, edited by uh, um, Horatio de la Costa, Father Horatio de la Costa. And so, um, yeah, Rizal trial. And then on December 28th, Colombia assigns the death verdict, and this was transmitted to Rizal the next day, December 29th at 6 a.m. Rizal was read his verdict by Captain Rafael Dominguez to be shot the next day at 7 a.m. at the Luneta de Bagumbay. Uh, December 29th, 7 a.m., he was transferred. Uh -huh. Wait a minute. Yeah, okay. Uh, Rizal was transferred to the chapel cell adorned by religious images to convince him to go back to the Catholic fold. His first visitors were Jesuit priest fathers Miguel Sadeva Mata and Luis Vita. Uh, so in many, if you're going to look at it, the funny thing was that uh, Jose Rizal was uh, uh, transferred in a room and most of his visitors were Jesuit priests. He was surrounded by Jesuit priests when, when, uh, during his last hours. Uh, and so Father Mata and Visa, um, after Father Sadeva left, Father Visa, Rizal asked Father Visa at 7.15 a.m. for the Sacred Heart statuette, which he carved when he was an Ateneo student. From his pocket, the statuette appears. So, there you go. And it's still there in the Ateneo. December 29, 8 a.m., Father Visa was relieved by Father Antonio Rossell, who joined Rizal for breakfast. Lieutenant Luis Taviel de Andrade joins them. At 9 a.m., Father Federico Faura, of Father Fa Padre Faura fame, who once said that Rizal would lose his head for writing the Noli Me Tangere, arrived. Rizal told him, Father, you are indeed a prophet. Uh, very sad. 10 a.m., Father Jose Villa Clara, and Estanislao March visited Rizal, followed by a Spanish journalist Santiago de Mataix, Santiago Mataix of El Heraldo de Madrid for an interview. Uh, and then, in Malacanian Palace, a letter was sent to the Governor General by Jose Rizal's mother, pleading to sa uh, save the life of Jose Rizal. Now, there's this, uh, shall we say, um, urban legend that the mother of Jose Rizal climbed the stairs of Malacanang, weeping and uh, crawling. Crawling to beg for, his, for her son's life. This urban legend was heard by Manuel Quezon. That's why when he became president, he established a ritual that every president afterwards who assumes office in Malacanang will do which is the ritual climbing of the Malacanang stairs for the very first time as president. 
Because what happens there is that Manuel Quezon wanted to be photographed climbing the stairs, standing up, and very proud. Because he was the very first uh, leader of the Philippines who steps in Malacanang who was not a foreigner. And he said, I, I, and, and, and according to his relatives, he did that because he wanted to avenge Teodora Alonso, uh, who have to you know, crawl from those steps to, to beg the governor general. We do not know that this story is true, but the impact was there. And so since then, from Manuel Quezon to the present president, the ritual climbing of the stairs happened because it, te it tells there it, it tells them that, you know, um, we are now the leader of the Filipino, Philippines. And no, and to Manuel Quezon, that means that no Filipino has to beg for his life. Manuel Quezon commuted the death penalty during his time. He did not implement it. That's why um, we, uh, that story, that urban legend was uh, had an impact. So Doña Chudora begged for the life of his son to the governor general, but of course she did not listen. On December 29, from 12 to 3 p.m., Rizal's time alone in his cell, the, in, in, in millennial parlance, we call this me time. Uh, he had lunch, wrote letters, and probably wrote his last poem of 14 stanzas, which he wrote in his flowing handwriting in a very small piece of paper. He hid it inside his alcohol stove. It was not a lamp. It was actually a cooking stove. Uh, this was one of his letters to uh, Ferdinand Blumentritt, in which he said, and I quote, My dear brother, Professor Ferdinand Blumentritt, when you receive this letter, I shall be dead. Tomorrow at seven, I shall be shot. But I am innocent of the crime of rebellion. I am going to die with a tranquil conscience. Goodbye, my best and my dearest friend, and never think ill of me. Vive bien, mi mejor y querido amigo, y nunca. Mal de mí, something like that. My Spanish is not so good, but you can see there uh, what I just read in English. Uh, Fort Santiago, December 29, 1896, signed Jose Rizal. Regards to the entire family. To Senora Rosa, Lole, Conradito, and Federico, I am leaving a book for you as a last remembrance of um, I also mentioned that he probably wrote the poem not on the night of his execution, but uh, a little earlier, because the record was that this poem was given in the afternoon before he died. Uh, and so the untitled poem was later known as Mi Ultimo Adios, My Last Farewell. In its second stanza, he already praised the revolutionaries in the battlefield for giving their lives without doubt, without gloom. And I think this is the, la the last words of a person is his last statement about the revolution. Okay, in which he said, in barricades and battle, fighting with delirium, others donate you their lives without doubts, without gloom. The sight doesn't matter. Cypress, Laurel, or Lily, Gibet, or open field combat, or cruel martyrdom are equal when demanded by country and home. And so, Rizal, in the end, finally agreed and praised the Philippine Revolution. This poem will be used by Andres Bonifacio, will be translated by Andres Bonifacio or the Katipuna, whoever it is who that translated it for the very first time in Tagalog and proliferated it to the Katipuneros. And in this way, the Katipunan claimed to serve already as their hero. It is in this poem he also called the Philippines Pearl of the Orient. Perla del Mar de Oriente, Nuestro Perdido Eden. Land that I love, farewell, or land the sun loves. Pearl in the sea of the Orient, Eden lost their brood. Gaily go high to present you this hapless, hopeless life. Were it more brilliant, had it more freshness, more blue. Still for you would I give it, would give it for your good. 
This is Nick Joaquin's translation, which for me is the best English translation of the Multimodios. Enchantment of my life, my ardent, avid obsession. To your help, cries the soul so soon to take the last leap. To your help, oh lovely, how lovely to fall that you may rise. To perish that you may live, to die beneath your skies. And upon your enchanted ground, the eternities to sleep. Farewell, my parents, my bad brothers, fragments of my soul, friends of old and playmates in childhood's ravished house. Offer thanks that I rest from the restless day. Farewell, sweet foreigner, my friend, my delight. Creatures I love, farewell. To die is to repose. Now, only a few of the 14 stanzas in Osevisal's last farewell. On December 29 at 3 p.m., and this is where we resolve a long-standing issue. According to an account of the agent of the Cuerpo de Vigilancia, Gandhi Rizal Cell, Rizal signed what seems to be the document retracting his anti-Catholic writings and his membership to Masonry. This event is still a contentious issue among Rizal experts. But, if we're going to look at it, I myself was anti-retraction before. But, because, you know, I did not really want to believe totally Father Balaguer's statement, even if it was a primary source. Huh? I said, I want a third, I want another source. Maybe one of the guards reported or wrote about it. Maybe it will give light, shed light to it. And you know what happened? Huh? The Cuerpo de Vigilancia documents were released to the Filipinos. These are the spy documents of the Spaniards. And there it was, the report of the guard in the cell on the same day that Jose Rizal died. He reported it on that same day after it happened. And it says there, uh, so that is the date of the document, Manila, 30 de December de 1896. Uh, El Inspector Jefe Federico Moreno, in which Rizal, in many ways, uh, he was, it was said that he signed the document and Josephine Bracken uh, was married to him after that in the morning. So it's around the 3 p.m. that uh, the, the report uh, was said that the uh, Rizal was actually actually uh, signed something and it is the retraction it said. Uh, but I have a lecture about this. I do not want this to be long. I have uh, a, a separate lecture called the, the Retraction of Jose Rizal uh, based on the findings of René Escalante, NHCP chair, about the Cuerpo de Villancia documents. I hope you can watch that in my YouTube channel. Now, he then called this uh, family yung mga malalakas ang loob. Those who are brave, visit me. And so they did. On December 29, 4 p.m., visit of Prisal's mother, Tudora Alonso, and then of Prisal's sister, Trinidad. Uh, she entered to get her mother and Rizal whispered to her, in English, referring to the alcohol stove, there is something inside. And of course, that was the last poem. Oh. They were also accompanied by Narcisa, Lucia Josefa, Maria, and San Mauricio Cruz, Morris. Leoncio Lopez Rizal, Narcisa's 11-year-old son, was not allowed to enter the cell. Uh, it was said that they were not allowed to hug. And that was a very painful thing. So the, Rizal gave them gifts. Narcisa, a weaker chair, Angelica, a niece, a handkerchief, Mauricio, nephew, belt, watch, and chain. And uh, despite some depictions, it was said that they, they were not allowed to hunt. Uh, while leaving for their carriages, an official handed over the alcohol stove to Narcisa. After their visit, Fathers Villaclara and Estenislao March returned to the cell, followed by Father Ross. On December 29, 6 p.m., Rizal was visited by the Dean of the Manila Cathedral, Don Silvino Lopez Tunyon. Father March left. Father Villaclara to be uh, Father March left Father Villaclara to be with the two. 
On December 29, 8 p.m., Rizal's Last Supper, where he informed Captain Dominguez that he already forgave those who condemned him. 9.30 p.m., Rizal was visited by the fiscal of the Royal Audiencia of Manila, Don Gaspar Sestano, with whom Rizal offered the best chair of the set. According to accounts, the fiscal left with a good impression of Rizal's intelligence and character. Now, um, of course, Rizal rested. According to Father um, Balaguer, and by the way, I would like to say something about Father Balaguer. And you, you will see it in the retraction lecture that I have. In the record of this guy, uh, in the record of this guy, the guard of the Guardia Civil, uh, he mentioned every priest that came in the cell. But Father Balaguer was not there. He did not mention any Father Balaguer entering the cell. He recorded everybody who entered except Father Balaguer. So, it is now our theory that Father Balaguer was not in the cell and he wrote what seemed to be a first-hand account which was probably an amalgamation of the accounts of the real priests who were there. Huh? Father Bilaclava, Father March, Father, and, and all the other priests. So that was that. Now, this was already the day, B day, December 30, 5:30 a.m. Rizal took his last meal, according to stories told to Narcisa by Lieutenant Luis Tabiel de Andrade. Rizal threw some eggs in the corner of a cell for the poor rats. He said, Let them have their fiesta too. Rizal also wrote to his family and to his brother. So, basically, he wrote to his family. He said, I ask for forgiveness for the pain I cause you, but someday I shall have to die and it is better that I die now in the plenitude of my conscience. Dear parents, brothers, and sisters, give thanks to God that I may preserve my tranquility before my death. I die resigned, hoping that with my death you will be left in peace. Ah, it is better to die than to live suffering. Console yourselves. I enjoin you to forgive one another the little meannesses of life and to try to live united in peace and good harmony. Treat your old parents as you would like to be treated by your children later. Love them very much in my memory. Bury me in the ground. Place a stone and a cross over it. My name, the death of my birth and my death, nothing more. If later you wish to surround my grave with a fence, you can do so. No anniversaries. I prefer Pang Bundok. You know what happened to this letter? I tell you. Rizal did not listen to this letter. The results. Because you know what happened, right? They built the monument. <laughs> Even Pacano Rizal was part of the community to build the monument over his grave. <laughs> but you know why they did not listen? Because they did not receive this letter. This letter was only given back to the Philippine government in the 1950s. Therefore, there was no way that Rizal family was able to fulfill the wish of Rizal for a simple grave because they did not know of any request. They did not read this letter. Okay? And another thing, Pasiano, he wrote Pasiano, his brother, and said, it has been four years and a half and we have not seen each other nor have we communicated with each other. I do not think it is due to lack of affection on my part, nor on yours, but because knowing each other so well, we do not need to talk to understand each other. I am thinking now how hard you have worked to give me a career. I believe I have tried not to waste my time. Brother of mine, if the fruit has been bitter, it is not my fault, but the fault of circumstances. 
I know that you have suffered much on my account and I am sorry. Now I am about to die. I forgot to read this line before that. It is you that I dedicate my last line to tell you how sad I am to leave you alone, my life. Burdened with the weight of the family and our old parents. I am sure you, brother, that I die innocent of this crime, of rebellion. If my former writings have contributed, I do not deny it absolutely. But then I thought I have expiated for the past with my deportation. Tell our father I remember him and how I remember my whole childhood of his affection and his love. Ask him to forgive me for the pain that I, I have unwillingly caused him. On December 30 at 5 a.m., Tiri I, Josephine Bracken, and Josefa Rizal came. According to the testimony of the agent of the Cuerpo de Vigilancia, which again proves the retraction, Josephine and Rizal were married. And why do we also believe that the Rizal retraction happened? Because Jose Rizal gave his wife a copy of The Imitation of Christ, a Catholic classic by Thomas A. Kempis, and it said there to my dear and unhappy wife, Josephine, December 30th, 1896. One, if he did not retract, why did he give them the imitations of Christ? Why did he give them the imitations of Christ? If he did not retract, why did he call him his wife? Hmm? So, and then in the last poem, another thing why we shall I think we shall retracted now. Because in the, in the, what's that? In the last poem of Rizal, if there's just a cross there in my grave, you know, they said that this grave will have a cross. So if he did not believe in Catholicism, why, why do you put a cross there? See? So there it is. Okay, I'll try to make this fast. And to my dear and unhappy wife, Josephine, December 30, 1896. Eventually, Josephine joined the Philippine Revolution and he, she even killed one Spaniard. He asked... Uh, the Katipuneros to make the Casa Hacienda de Tejeros a military hospital for the Katipunan. And she was actually there in the Tejeros Convention asking people to talk their differences and to be calm during the Tejeros Convention that unseated Andres Bonifacio as president of the revolutionary government. And so Josephine and the sisters also brought Rizal's poem to Andres Bonifacio in Cavite. Eventually, after that. Okay? I think that on that day itself, he was already going to uh, Cavite. She was already going to Cavite. On December 36 a.m., we salve out his father, Francisco Mercado. My beloved father, pardon me for the pain with which I repay you for your sorrows and sacrifices for my education. I did that want, nor did I prefer it. Goodbye, father. Goodbye. And then, to his mother, she only had a few words. To my very dear mother, Senora Doña Teodora Alonso, 6 o'clock in the morning, December 30, 1896. Jose Rizal. Uh, maybe they did not need words for this to express their love for each other. On December 36, 30 a.m., that march from Fort Santiago to Bagumbayan begins. Four soldiers with bayoneted rifles lead the procession followed by Rizal, Taviel de Andrade, Fathers Villa Clara and March and other soldiers. They passed by the Intramuros Plaza, then turned right to the Postigo Gate, then left at Malecon, the Bayside Road now known as Bonifacio Drive. So they they passed by here. This Fort Santiago, this is the Plaza of Fort Sant uh, of Intramuros, passed by the Malik, uh, the Santa Lucia, and then the Malecon to the place of execution. Okay. So he walked calmly. It was like a procession. It builds up the drama. According to Flora Kibuyan, he did not ride a, uh, a horse-drawn carriage. And he saw the Ateneo and said, Is that the Ateneo, Father? Yes. I spent so many happy moments there. And then he saw the beach and said, I spent many... Happy moments here with my love. Abay, nagdadama pa. That's why I call him Mimo. Nagdadama pa, mamamatay na lang. And so, again, eventually, 
he went he, he appeared in ano to he they appeared already in the luneta the bagumbayan the crowd was waiting there no? just like the execution of gomez burgos and samora on around the same place uh, where they were executed by garote uh, which was uh, yeah uh, a vile instrument actually it was not just rizal who was executed uh, in late uh, there are many days during that time that uh, the spiders executed en mass some of the suspected the uh, um, revolutionaries in the luneta you see the blood uh, the pavement there is filled with blood of a lot of the revolutionaries, the heroes who brought their, who gave their lives to the people. And those were implicated because Rizal, who told the Katipunan, you should neutralize those who do not help you. Aba, eh, yung mga hindi tumulong sa kanila na mayaman, they put, his, their na- they put their names in the supporters of the Katipunan. And when the documents were caught, they were all arrested. Huh? So there you go. So, yeah, these are the, when, when they were already dead. So Rizal, they said, was like looking for someone as if when they when he appeared in the Luneta. And there was, of course, a plan by the Katipunan to rescue Jose Rizal, in which the brother Pasiano told the Andres Bonifacio, supposedly, that you know, Rizal did, do not want to sacrifice uh, another life. It's better that he was the one to sacrifice his life and no one else, because rescuing him would be bloody. At 7 a.m., Rizal arrived at the execution site of the Luneta, was checked with his pulse by Dr. Felipe Ruiz Castillo. It was perfectly normal. Rizal once wrote, I wish to show those, I wish to show those who deny us patriotism that we know how to die for our duty and our convictions. Um, and of course, the captain uh, said, Preparen. And uh, um, the guns cocked and the bullets were placed. Apunten and the guns pointed at Jose Rizal. And uh, that is the exact same time when this shot was taken. The actual photograph of the Rizal execution. And Jose Rizal supposedly shouted, Consumatumes. Of course, there's a there's a, a speculation if this was actually heard or it was an invention or whatever. But it's in the record uh, that uh, Rizal shouted consumatumes. It is done. And at the sound at 7:03 a.m., when the captain shouted "fuego," shout ra- shouts rang out from the guns of eight Indian soldiers. Huh? Rizal, being a convicted criminal, was not facing the firing squad. And of course, he was supposed to lie, uh, to, to be shot face down, uh, facing down, so that he would die a traitor's death. Uh, but as he was seen, he was seen uh, to have resisted and turned himself to face his executioners. As he was hit, and Dr. Victorious here actually speculated that that was just a natural, uh, shall we say, rough, rough. Uh, natural uh, um, uh, um, way when the bullets hit you, it was just natural that it will turn that way. I don't know. We have doctors here, so I do not know. But it was seen, it was interpreted that he, because when he fell down, he did not fall like a traitor. <laughs> he fell down facing the sky. Uh, and of course, they finished him off with the Tiro de Gracia. In a shot in the head. So whatever it was, uh, it seems that Rizal got his, of course it was a painful death, it was tragic, but it was a death that catapulted him to legend. I wanted to see the face, according to Alberto B. Mendoza, he was one of the guards. I wanted to see the face of the man for the last time. Rizal lay dead on the dewy grass. The day had started and little did I realize that I was gazing at the face of the greatest Malayan of them all. And I was witnessing history in the making.
This is an allegorical image of Inang Bayan mourning for Jose Rizal. Of course, the family were not able to mourn. The nation was not able to mourn because after he was killed, he was just brought to a Paco Cemetery. The crowd shouted, Viva España! Muerte a los traidores! Long live Spain and death to traitors. But in two years, the victorious Philippine revolutionaries will seal the fate of the Spanish Empire in the East. 333 years of Spanish colonialism ended in 1898. Viva España, muerte a los traidores. On the site are Castrillo sculptures of the event and the last days of Jose Rizal as well. People now enjoy the park because now the Philippines is free because of the sacrifices of people like Jose Rizal. He was buried uh, in an unmarked grave and nobody knew. But Narcisa searched and discovered where her brother's body was and secretly buried at the old and new Spaco Cemetery. She asked the guards to place a marble plaque designed by Doroteo Ojuko containing Rizal's initials in reverse, RPJ, and this was Paco Park, which was already an unused cemetery at that time. This was the gravesite with Doña Teodora uh, there and the uh, admirers of Jose Rizal and the friends of Rizal. And uh, the, the place is still marked there and is still preserved as, uh, and they made it look uh, like uh, how it was before. On the 3rd, 17 August, 1898, four days after the Mac Battle of Manila, when the Americans took over the city, the remains of Rizal were exhumed. They were brought to Narcisa's house, washed and cleansed, and were placed in an ivory urn designed by Romualdo Teoro de Jesus. The urn stayed, stayed there until 1912. And these are the other things that were preserved from Rizal's grave, including his uh, torn um, suit. Uh, this was the marker where the house used to stand in Binondo, the Rizal family house. And Doña Tudora was said to memorize and recite the, el, the, noli, the, the, the ultimo adios to visitors. And they're going to, and, they, and, and she will show the skull of his son uh, as a sign of her love. Uh, Doña Tudora died before even burying Rizal once again on December 29, 1912 from Estrada Street in Binondo. The urn was transferred in a procession headed by the Masons and the Caballeros de Rizal to the Marble Hall of the Ayuntamiento de Manila. These are our ancestors. Huh? Our ancestors. Where it stayed overnight with the Knights on guard. So this was Manila shoreline. Uh, I mean, this was Manila's... Uh, this was the route. So from the Rizal family house to the Ayuntamiento, and then after that to the uh, Luneta. So this was the Ayuntamiento, which was the most beautiful building in Intamuro, supposedly, at that time. And they placed him, and they reconstructed it recently, actually. Reconstructed it recently. And they placed him in what we call the Marble Hall. There you go, that hall. He placed him there. That you that became the you know, yung the House of Representatives. Ano yun? Lower House, Philippine Assembly. I'm sorry, Philippine Assembly. This was the Hall of the Philippine Assembly. Yes. So December 30, 1912, morning in a solemn procession, the urn began its last journey to Rizal's final resting place, the base of the Sun Rice National Monument to Jose Rizal, and they place it there. So basically, this resolves the question, the urn is under the monument. It was not inside the monument. It's under the monument. Okay? December 30, 1913, the Rizal National Monument at the Luneta, after one year, was inaugurated. Its original design name was Motostella or Guiding Star. Rizal is our guiding star, basically. It was made by Swiss sculptor Dr. Richard Gisling, who earlier also made the National Monument William Tell, the national hero of Switzerland. Uh, on December 30, 2012, 100 years after the remains or the transfer of the remains of Rizal from Binondo to the side of the Rizal Monument, 
was recreated once again by the Order of the Knights of Rizal and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, first with the Masons, in commemoration of Rizal's 116th martyrdom anniversary. So we even copied the uniforms. Uh, uh, and uh, the urn was also uh, copied. That's Gemma Cruz Araneta representing the Rizal family, and I was there. See, I, I'm there. Okay. I did not join the pal bearers because I was supposed to be in the broadcast, television broadcast. And if I knew that the uh, television broadcast will not cover this, uh, they covered the flag raising, I should have joined them. Huh? I should have joined them. I should have been in that uh, beautiful uniform. Huh? Uh, but of course, what happened was, the, it, it was still very dark when we arrived at the Rizal Monument. Because the president will arrive, so that's why we have to do it uh, earlier. And we were able to place the urn. Uh, the knights and the masons together placed the urn at the monument. And so today, these places are still there as reminders where we can teach the young result story. And you know, it's very poignant that Vic Torres is here with us. Because when I was a kid, I visited Fort Santiago. It was the brochures made by Intramuros administration historian Jose Victor Torres that I read that inspired me, one of my inspiration to become a history teacher and a tour guide. And so now, I, 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 Vic Torres is here. I would like to thank him. He probably did not know the impact of that brochure that I read about the history of Intramuros and Rizal uh, that uh, I was actually inspired and imagined myself. I was also touring people and telling them the last hours of Jose Rizal. And now, in full circle, I am now uh, giving this lecture. And in many ways, uh, I think uh, uh, um, our many historians before, our sources, and uh, in many ways, I hope we can still visit Port Santiago because inside that cell or inside that uh, shrine, one, the, one of the bones of Jose Rizal, they took it out for posterity. So they did not bury everything under that monument. There's one piece that still exists. And this is the vertebra bone that was struck by the bullet. Uh, so you can still visit it in the, in the shrine inside Port Santiago. Uh, the physical manifestation that Jose Rizal actually lived. This is his evidence of his life. And so, basically, uh, this ends my lecture, but I would like to emphasize that whatever issues that we have about Rizal, the important thing is what he showed us. Uh, you can love your country by utilizing the talents that we have, we were given. Uh, um, and in a time of peace, we, did not, we do not have to die to love our country. We do not have to die to express ourselves. We do not have to die to search for our own identity. I would like to end with that moth, the story of the moth that ma his mother told him when he was young. Diba? The foolish moth. A mother told the moth, do not, do not be near the flame. Do not be near the flame because the flame will kill you. But the, but the foolish moth was curious and so he went to the flame, straight to the flame and he got burned. You know what that flame represented? That flame represented education and knowledge. During the time of Prizal, no? when you seek education, when you seek your own identity, you will get burned. You will die. But you know what happened? Rizal was the foolish moth. He was the one who went straight to the flame. Why? 
Because when he went straight to the flame and he died, the others who came after him did not have to die to get that flame and get that education. So our heroes, we owe it to our heroes that we are able to have our own identity and we are able to have the Knights of Prizal and we are talking about how we can create a better nation. Marami pong salamat at mabuhay tayo na. Mahalo. Thank you, Sir Xiao, for that uh, informative and very interesting lecture. Um, I now take pleasure in introducing our reactor to the presentation. Sir Clement Bautista, KGOR, is the former director of the Office of Multicultural Student Services at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He holds a bachelor's degree in anthropology and a master's degree in public policy from the University of Chicago and has pursued graduate studies in sociology and Southeast Asian history and philosophy at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He was the administrator of uh, EFIL, Filipino Digital Archives and History Center of Hawaii, an online resource about Filipinos and the Filipino experience in Hawaii. Sir Clem is a member of the board of directors of the Filipino Community Center and former president of the Filipino American Historical Society of Hawaii. He's a past commander of the Knights of Brazil Hawaii chapter. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our reactor, Sir Clem Bautista. Hi, good evening or good morning as, as it may be. Um, I'm so glad to be uh, uh, listening to uh, uh, Sir Michael Charles Chua's um, talk. Uh, very interesting, packed with information. Um, um, as I mentioned earlier, my background is in anthropology. So my interest in examining is not only in examining how and why the past informs the present, but also how our present constructs the past. And in this case, uh, from the archaeology of Rizal's writings, his biographers, his mythology and the legacies that he ha has left us, we also um, uh, look back and we actually recreate our own past through Rizal. Um, and so it was nice to hear what, what do we take the, the final you know, thing uh, from uh, Sir Michael. Um, what do we take from this lecture and discussion is really the love of our country and that we need to do better, you might say. We, we have the tools to do good um, and to get educated um, and uh, resolve in a, in a way, just like uh, the, the legend that he has created for ourselves, he has sacrificed himself for us. Uh, and it is appropriate, perhaps, that in uh, within two weeks, we will be re, uh, re-examining the same thing that uh, Sir Michael has gone through on his, his death. <laughs> um, so he, uh, Sir Michael gives a very detailed account of the process there. I love the idea that, that uh, he uh, gave us not only dates and, uh, and days, but um, time schedules too. Uh, and so that's really illuminating in terms of how things actually uh, came about. Um, when I started to learn about Rizal and the Philippines, that was in the 1980s. And at that time, uh, what was happening is um, the emergence of a uh, Aguinaldo cult, <laughs> which was you know, conflicting with what I was trying to learn about Rizal. And um, over time, that, that conflict, you know, the debates have, have continued, but it you know, has been up and down. And I think... Um, uh, according to Sir Michael, is yes, well, we, we are certainly appropriate in the honoring Rizal as a national hero. Uh, it was always my opinion that that was true, and for many of the reasons that uh, Sir Michael has given us. Um, um, but I do uh, want to point out some of the details that he, he, he gave us that I, I certainly didn't know too much about. Um, uh, the gray areas that he clarified, you might say, um, uh, one of them was, of course, the, the, the onset of the revolution versus his death. Obviously, yeah, they, they, one happened before the other. But I would also add that, you know, the revolution was, as, as, as it was, was pointed out, uh, precipitated by his legacy already being created um, through his books. Um, and so that was interesting. The, uh, the arrest, the resolve of uh, going to, uh, to Cuba and the attempt in uh, Singapore to... Uh, 
Rudy Sim. That was kind of interesting too. I, I, I had no, 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 about that one. Um, and, um, uh, it is it is a fitting I think that we re- recognize also Pacciano's uh, um, torturing and you know his imprisonment you know in uh, intramuros at the time when um, Rizal was actually you know kind of treated like a VIP prisoner. Um, uh, so we do owe more to you know the Pacciano's legacy too and, and his mem- and his memory. Um, the Katipunan uh, association with the Liga <laughs> La Liga Filipina. That's a, that's another brilliant kind of like association, which I think is it should be better known, um, and um, um, also. Um, uh, the, but the one, one, the one thing I think I think um, I I uh, was always conflicted with, and I came to a somewhat a different kind of understanding was with um, the retraction. <laughs> so this is going to be continually controversial because I think you know the documents that we have. Um, have always been filtered through, you know, the um, the, the uh, priests, the friars, the Jesuit friars. So even, you know, any documents that we have was always going through them. Uh, and so I try to look at it in terms of the acts versus the intentions. Of course, we we will we cannot know the intentions purely, uh, but what Rizal did, he had certain intentions in, uh, that maybe are go beyond what's on the surface. And so, um, in order to um, to to uh, seal a marriage with um, Josephine Bracken, uh, the retraction was necessary. Um, and I think uh, doing that in order to um, to uh, to keep that marriage, you know, let me say sanctified, uh, he would re- do the retraction. Um, but whether his intent was really a serious one or you know for the, for just a practical one, I think that's still up for debate. Um, uh, only because one, um, he, he gives little evidence in, in, in his last writings about going back to the fold, coming back to the Catholic fold. Um, and uh, his, the way his, his body was treated didn't seem to be very Catholic to me. Um, and uh, I think uh, so, uh, and the fact that many of these documents came up, came uh, emerged years after his death. Um, I think gives evidence to some filtering, you might say, by uh, by the institute, Catholic institution. Um, I think we know that from uh, many other con- more contemporary kind of like issues that um, institutions uh, of power will filter, you know, the information that is eventually released. Um, and um, uh, Professor Chua has also gave a lot of um, context to documents. I think that's something that we all must be aware of. So again, to 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 look at the wider context of how these documents were created, we have you know uh, many listings you know of the documents, uh, but they're just you know the documents. And I think you have to fill in as as historians, buddy historians, uh, we have to all fill in the context, try to relate them to each other. And I think um, Sir Michael has done an excellent job in in that, and we all need to do that continuously. Again, part of it is our own, you know, investment in doing this. Um, And that's where I think here the the present uh, recreates our past here. Um, uh, The urban legend of um, uh, Rizal's mother uh, was very interesting too. And I did not know that, that Kazan's legacy of uh, climbing the stairs is part of that. Um, That again, creating a past, you know, or recreating a past, creating a legend, uh, by for for present use, um, and then his uh, letters to the I guess nineteen fifties letters to his families uh, and others I think it, it really gave no mention of the retraction. So that again I I, I don't put too much um, I guess uh, uh, weight with um, anybody who says you know he signed something uh, and was serious about it. You know he did it because he wanted to get married. Um, I think the Dapitan, uh, there was a Dapitan uh, retraction letter, supposedly also created, but never filed or something. Um, uh, so again, once again, that's, that's the same thing. I don't want to take too much time because I think there could be a lot of questions here, uh, uh, Q&A session, because uh, there's so much information that uh, was presented to us. And um, uh, I would like to open it up to everyone else, actually. 
Thank you, uh, Sir Clem, for uh, your insightful comments. Uh, we now start the Q and A portion, and uh, uh, Sir Dr. Fred Magdalena, Associate Director of the Center for Philippine Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, will serve as moderator. Sir Fred. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate the uh, long lecture of Sir uh, Michael Xiao Chua. Uh, he exceeded some of our expectations. Uh, normally we do this in uh, about 45 minutes or so, but he gave us a long but very worthy lecture of about one hour and 20 minutes. So uh, I, I, I think he struck several chords about the last days of Brazil, which many don't know, especially uh, those aspects about retraction, about the manifesto, which was never published by the Spanish authorities. And of course, um, the debate about whether uh, Rizal was uh, um, in favor or not in favor of the Philippine Revolution, which was you know, uh, looming at the time. Um, and uh, Dr. Pio uh, Valenzuela uh, uh, gave us some hint, according to Dr. Chua's lecture, about results, inner thoughts about the revolution. Um, I guess uh, we should start out with the warning that you can either raise your hand to uh, give, to ask an oral question or you can uh, write your question on the chat board so uh, Dr. Chua can uh, answer them. Uh, I don't see any uh, question yet except commentaries and expression of thanks on the chat board. So uh, the floor is now open for uh, the first uh, salvo of uh, anybody who would like to ask questions. Sir Federico, uh, yes. first of all, uh, before we start getting comments and questions, I would like to apologize to the uh, Aloha chapter. Uh, again, <laughs> as I said, uh, even if I wanted the lecture to be for an, uh, an hour long, it was, uh, I really enjoyed talking to people who actually will uh, think that this is a worthy cause or a worthy topic. Now, before I, I proceed, I forgot to say something. I forgot to say a very important, uh, um, shall we say, point that was raised by a, a lecture by Benito Legarda Jr., who is also a historian. You know the, you know the priests? Father Estanislao March, Father Bilaclara, and Father, pa Father Paura. Uh, who were there? The Jesuit priests who were there. According to his speech, none of these priests would survive those scenes so painful. Huh? All three priests would die before a year had passed and Father Paura before a month had passed on January 23, 1897. Father Paura was already dead. His very simple funeral went unnoticed in a city full of newly arrived military and revolutionary turmoil. Father March passed away on May 18 at the Ateneo and Father Villa Clara on September 19 at Sea near Aden. They were all in their middle 50s. Father March was 55, Fathers Paura and Villa Clara 56. Ang mabata pala nila. Oh. So one of the priests who were with them, Father Paypoch, reflected that the bullets that killed their beloved disciple can be considered to have killed all three of them. Oh. The statement is remarkable for having been made to a Spanish audience yung uh, speech ni Father Paypoch about the three priests. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's quite interesting because Father Bilaclave and March witnessed the execution. So, uh, it, may, it, 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 it is said that uh, the, this friend of theirs, a uh, Jesuit priest, in many ways, uh, is telling us that it affected them. So, that's, that's the impact. And you know that the Spanish Prime Minister was, uh, was shot and the uh, anarchist who shot him said that they, he was avenging the execution of Jose Luis. That, that's very clear. So the impact was actually international. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Chua, for that 
additional note. So uh, let us hear some questions uh, about his lecture, uh, which is uh, very, very interesting. And for the first time, uh, you might have heard some of those, uh, you know, uh, which were not published before, uh, but uh, are now spoken to us by our uh, speaker. Okay, um, any question? Uh, you can raise your hand. Okay, uh, Sir Jun. Yeah, I, um, you know, I just mentioned that um, uh, Dr. Rizal and Josephine Bracken were actually married. Mm -hmm. And, but there was no mention at all of who the priest was. Ah. I mean, there was no, nothing uh, written about who uh, officiated the marriage and so on. And so forth. You know, I, I, I do not have here the Cuerpo document, the transcription of the Cuerpo document. That's the problem. Uh, I will try to look at it. But it's only either one of Villa Clara or March. So because they're the only two priests that were there, who were recorded by uh, the soldier to be there. So yeah, Dr. Big Torres, uh, I think have a definite answer. Dr. Torres? Yes, Mr. so it was Father March. Ah, si March, okay, good. Father March, thank you. Father March, okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, any more questions uh, written or oral? I like the, I like Sir Clement's, uh, shall we say, I like Sir Clement's uh, uh, rejoinder about the, the, uh, no, the intention of the retraction. Because I myself believe that, because, you know, it was a very sweeping retraction that says, yes, I abjure, I abjure masonry, but I take back everything that I wrote against the church. Uh, and of course, uh, people are saying that sweeping, he was cancelling the very reason he was a hero, the no limit angere and the El Filibusterismo. But it can also be clarified that uh, Rizal was not actually anti church or anti religion. He was against the, uh, shall we say, he was against the personnel of the church. And uh, I, yeah, I'm interested in. Uh, uh, in uh, no, in uh, listening to the thoughts of Dr. Jose Victor Torres about the lecture and about the matter. Sir Vic? Yes, uh, good Morning. afternoon po sa lahat. Uh, good afternoon sa uh, Yeah, good afternoon sa inyo at sa yung mga listeners no dito sa lecture mo. Actually no my my take then also no uh, you have to pardon me no? I'm outside because that's why uh, I can't turn on my video. I mean, uh, I mean uh, <laughs> no problem. I'm in a party. <laughs> Listen to your <laughs> lecture. <laughs> it's a family gathering. And um, uh, my, my take is that Rizal may have indeed signed the retraction. I'm sure of that. Because um, if we're going to study the retraction document, people kept concentrating on the signature of Rizal, na fake yan, and everything. No? But people do not concentrate on the other signatures of the eyewitnesses. And right. if you compare them to the existing documents signed by these eyewitnesses, they're exactly the same. No, walang, walang pila kaiba. It wasn't even forged now. It, it was actually the signatures of the, um, of the uh, witnesses who were there. No? So the, the question of the authenticity of the document is uh, not based on the signature of Rizal, but if you compare it to the signatures of the actual witnesses, the military officers who were there, they're mm -hmm. actually the same. No, walang, walang no? Right, right. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and probably one thing that I can say, no, at first, like you, I didn't believe he retracted. But after all of this evidence came out, no, um, I believe that he retracted. I believe that he retracted, but I, I already think that he was already thinking, and this is just speculative. I already was thinking that he may have already realized that how much of his teachings are already embedded. Right. In that, in that signing everything away with one signature, it's no longer, it's no longer just some, something that can disappear. <laughs> yeah. No? Uh, I, I remember in dialogue dito sa paborito nating sila, no? Shao Yu Bayaling Third World. Right. After he, signed, after he signed the retraction document, what did he ask Father, ano, Father um, Bilaclara? <laughs> Father, 
sa palagay niyo ba maniniwala ang mga tao piling ba ang kuya <laughs> so i really believe no i really believe he retracted but i also believe that he felt that no matter how much he would sign a document his teachings and his uh, writings are already too much embedded yun lang patakbo ng katipunan eh right no? so i believe that ano, i believe that uh, uh, para sa kanya i signed this bali wala ito no because mm-hmm. i'm already I'm already there yeah. in fulfilling my uh, my destiny for the people. Maraming salamat. Sir, thank you po. That was very much appreciated. I, I, just, I just want to add perhaps, and I, again, I wasn't there, but um, the, the whole, uh, you might say, train of uh, uh, friars who would come in to talk to him. I mean, we had that timeline there where You know, one comes in, one goes out. It's almost like a you know, police interrogation. Right, um, right, right. Uh, and uh, so whether he was under duress, you know, right, uh, or just just the idea of hey, I want to just get this done and move on. You know, um, yeah. He seemed to be very confident. Same with the December 15 manifesto. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it was probably under duress or whatever. And I would like to take note also that. Uh, The signatures or the the I think it was Federico More, Moreno Elo, Eloy More the the one who signed the documents I I I I forgot to to get it's in the other lecture that I have those who signed the documents were actually recorded by the guard to have entered the cell so it, these are all uh, that the sources triangulation of sources that really confirms that the document uh, is really Uh, is really authentic, except that of course the intention could be not not to holy, uh, but also because I believe that Rizal wanted to give legitimate for the first time to legitimize Josephine, because the, Josephine was born illegitimate, de ba? Uh, no no no, Josephine was in a way uh, an orphan, and uh, he, uh, she, she, yeah raised by a uh, uh, shall we say. A stepfather, and so he, Rizal wanted to give her uh, some honor before he dies. So that's why he agreed to do the retract. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Mm-hmm. Can I comment on the? Uh, yes, sir. December 15 manifesto. Mm-hmm. Uh, though this was not widely published, right? Except lately, uh, some people have seen it. Uh, like um, Renato Constantino must have read it. Yeah, right. He did. He, he, did. Must, he, used, yeah. he must have used that principally as the basis for his argument about the anti-hero character of uh, Rizal, anti-revolutionary. You know. In all that, so uh, um, by reading the text and um, trying to make sense of what's in between the lines, it seems to me that Rizal was expressing his frustration mm-hmm. against the Katipunan, and right. uh, to some extent. He's angry about those actions of the Katipunan, you know, asking donations uh, uh, for his family and things like yeah. that. I think he did not like some of those things happening. Of course. Um, yeah. And, um, but at the same time, uh, um, I think he already sensed that his end is near. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, probably... Uh, he also wanted to uh, please his, uh, you know, his um, um, torturers, <laughs> you might say, and um, um, to some extent, uh, you know, um, uh, give some weight on uh, what they're doing, uh, even if... Uh, Uh, it is against his will, you know. So right. uh, that's just my uh, interpretation of those. Uh, I believe that the document is authentic, as you have yeah. also uh, affirmed. 
but there is an angle to it that um, might give weight to the uh, argument uh, against Rizal, you know, for being anti-revolutionary. Although um, uh, other documents would say otherwise, okay, especially uh, his uh, poem uh, where uh, he gave them credit, you know, uh, for uh, dying for the country. I think that's very, very important also, which many people miss, you know, because uh, they just look at it as a poem, you know, uh, in a very uh, poetical way, uh, uh, bereft of meaning. But I think you're right in uh, pointing out that some of the lines, you know, uh, 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 Rizal wanted to give credit to the revolutionaries. Okay, uh, it's already seven o'clock sharp in my clock. Uh, uh, sir, uh, for I think I, I would like to give uh, Sir Victor uh, last, okay. uh, the last uh, uh, comment. The last uh, comment. Uh, okay, okay, that will be the last comment because it's already seven. Okay. Thank you so yeah, much. My, my, yeah, my apologies. So, um, my apologies, uh, Shao, no? uh, because I'm uh, sorry, Sir, Sir Federico, because I. This uh, topic has always been a favorite topic of between us and Shao, no? whenever we would talk about it. Well, um, if you look closely at both the manifesto and Rizal's defense that he wrote in the, you know, for his uh, trial, no? one of the things that he always expresses is, is that he did it like the revolution of the Katipunan. And that has always been uh, spouted by many of the nationalists and everything. No? But it is so different because if, you, if you've seen a if you witness the results of a revolution, it was happening in Spain at the time. So Rizal already knew that somehow, some way, a revolution might be a solution to what was happening to the Philippines. Now, what was written actually in the manifesto and both the, uh, his defense, you have to look at it very closely because he does condemn the Katipunan as a bloody revolution. However, he proposes another, he proposes another kind of revolution. It's a revolution of the educated. It's there. It's, it's there in the sentence after the law, after uh, he condemned the Katipulan in the manifesto. The reason why we always get stuck, no? that's why tama po kayo na kailangan basahin ng mabuti itong mga dokumento. No? Because what is written there is that Rizal had another solution. His solution was another revolution. But it was a revolution of the educated. It's also written in his, in his uh, the Philippines century within. No, because he felt that if it is a revolution of the masses, it will be a revolution, a bloody revolution, which happened with the Katipunan. That's why he didn't like the Katipunan revolution. But he had an idea now that the, if it's going to be a revolution of the intellectuals, it will be diplomatic. It will negotiate something like autonomy for the Filipinos. It will be a revolution because it will change the status of the Philippines and it will be done by educated people. That was his revolution. No, you ha you, 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 we have to look at the, the documents carefully because it is written there. But un unfortunately, and I attribute this to much of the nationalism that happened in the 1950s, part of this, the part of this is not discussed. No? And part of this is not mentioned at all by many of the nationalists because it will go against their, ano, their agenda of, um, of a nationalism by revolution, by a bloody revolution. No, you lamang po. You just read everything that was written by Rizal because there's a lot of meaning there that we somehow miss whenever we talk about uh, Jose Rizal. Marami salamat po. Marami salamat din siya. And uh, the good thing is he wrote these things in this book, What Capitan Tiago Served and Padre Damaso Ate. And I, one of the chapters here, one of the essays, I gave a link. It's about it's an old version, but you can read it and I, I hope you can also I uh, get this book. Maraming salamat, Sir Vic. Thank you, Sir uh, salamat. Federico. Salamat po. Okay. okay. Uh, I now give the floor back to uh, Sir June to say the last word. Well, thank you, Sir Fred. Um, uh, it has been a lively exchange of ideas, but uh, we have to end the discussion. Sorry about that. Um, I would like to thank our distinguished lecturer and our equally distinguished reactor, as well as our participants for this very interesting educational exercise. It is my hope that this lecture has given us a better understanding of who our national hero is. Uh, this ends our 12th and final lecture in the Rizalian Lecture Series Part 1 
sponsored by the Knights of Rizal Aloha Chapter. Tune in for the start of part two of the lecture series, which will begin next year. The first lecture will be on January 29, 2022, same time. Sir Dr. Floro Kibuyen, KCR, retired professor at the University of the Philippines and now a resident of Sydney, Australia, will be our lecturer. And uh, his lecture will focus on the El Filibusterismo. Until then, mahalo and aloha to all of you. Stay safe, everyone.